Protecting yourself starts with good legal tools. The most important documents that you should have are what we call power of attorneys. There's two types of power of attorney. There's the financial power of attorney and the healthcare power of attorney. And there's also will, wills and trusts. Basically, what is a power of attorney? A power of attorney is a written legal document where one person, the principal, i.e. say me, authorizes another person to act on my behalf, i.e. I usually, you know, most people point their spouse. So if I'm sick, my spouse is going to take care of my affairs, if you trust your spouse. We're talking about the health care power of attorney. Once again, you know, if I'm, if I'm well, I take care of my affairs. However, if I'm sick and I can't manage my affairs, I'm going to authorize someone else to make those decisions for me. I'm going to appoint a health care power of attorney. So what can they do? They can talk to doctors, nurses, consent to surgery, admit or discharge from a hospital or nursing home. You know, they can review all my re medical records as well to make educated choices for me, okay? Also part of our power of attorney is what we call a living will. And, uh, or a healthcare medical directive. There's different things. And what is that? But that, what your living will is expressing your wishes upon your end of life. So if you're in a vegetative state, end stage condition or extreme physical disability, you're saying just let me go, but provide me comfort care. And the other one is what we call a financial power of attorney. Once again, I'm in charge. However, if I'm sick and I can't make decisions for myself, I'm going to appoint someone else to make those decisions for me. Usually, once again, it's usually a spouse. So what can we do? We can open and close bank accounts. We, set, we can sell our properties. Um, God forbid we were in a lawsuit. We could defend us in a lawsuit. We can make gifts. We can create a trust. Now, it used to be with the financial power of attorney, banks, financial institutions did not have to recognize the power of attorney, the financial power of attorney. So if you went to BB&T or M&T or PNC, they could have you do their own power of attorney. A few years ago, Marilyn said, hey, this is crazy. What we're going to do is we're going to make you know, a statutory power of attorney. And as long as that financial power of attorney is what we call substantially similar to that code, the statutory power of attorney, the banks have to recognize it. What happens now, so we, we conform to that statute, so if, if you end up going into a bank or whatever and they say we don't recognize it, we can get it enforced, okay? So if you've had a power of attorney that is, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years old, you might want to update your financial power of attorney to conform to the law, okay? And there's also, what we need is specific language. It's called unlimited gifting. This is crucial for what we do. What it means is if you've got, you know, what you have to do is you've got a power of attorney, you need to go back and review your power of attorney to make sure that you have what we call a gifting clause. I hereby allow my financial power of attorney to make unlimited gifts because this is crucial for what we do to try and protect your assets. Because if it doesn't have that, then you could be done for, your power of attorney could be done for elder abuse. Most people think, well, I can only give away 14,000, you know, it used to be 10,000, it's now $14,000, and that's all you can give away. But actually, you can give up to about approximately $5.4 million in your lifetime without any tax ramifications to you or the person that you, you're going to give it to. You just have to report it to the IRS. So for gifting, we don't really have to worry about tax consequences, okay? The problem is, is with the gifting, you know, you've got the tax gorilla over there that we don't have to worry about. However, with the gifting, we've got the Medicaid gorilla, and that's where the problem is, okay? And I'm going to explain that, okay? Because I see some inquisitive, you know, questions. Oh, wait a minute here. So we're going to cover this in a little while. So, reasons to have an attorney review your power of attorney, or you should review it yourself, is the unlimited gifts. So, you know, also part of the, uh, the power of attorney, we've got to set up what we call irrevocable trust and make sure it conforms to the new Maryland law. Now, when you die, your power of attorneys die with you, and that's when you go into your last will and testaments and trusts. So, what is a last will and testament? Well, as one of my clients said, what is it you do with your stuff once you're gone? Who's going to get my stuff, okay? 
And then part of the last will and testament, you're going, to rep, uh, you're going to appoint what we call a personal representative. We used to call them administrators, executors. And what they are doing is managers of your estate to make sure that all your wishes are taken care of. Most people have what I call I love you will. So I'm leaving everything to my spouse. If my spouse dies before me, I'm leaving it to my child. That sounds pretty common. I call that the I love you will. So if I die, I'm going to leave everything to my spouse. My spouse has all of her assets. If she goes into the nursing home, all her assets have to be spent down to get on Medicaid. But to get Medicaid as a single person, you've got to have assets below $2,500. Okay, so if you have CDs, bank accounts, IRAs, $2,500. Total assets, including your house. Well, they can't force you to sell the house if you're a single person, but what they're going to do is put liens against your home. The average stay in a nursing home is four years at 10,000, that's half a million bucks. So if you have a $300,000 home, it's going to go. So what I like is, I love you, but, okay? I love you, but because we're going to talk about that because there's a thing called a spousal election and a spousal trust. So let's say the estate was $100,000. The husband said, I'm leaving everything to the son. The, the, the spouse can come in and say, whoa, wait a minute here. I want to get my spousal election and then I can get my 30, 40 or 50%. Okay? And then so what we're going to use is the spousal election and the spousal trust, and this is what we do. I'm going to give you an I, lo I love you will, however, I'm only going to give what we call the elective share to my spouse. So if the elective share, and then this, I'm dead, and if the spouse goes in to the nursing home, only the elective share could be used on the nursing home. The other area is in a trust and the trust is going to protect those assets for his or her benefit. I know it's a little bit confusing. So let's say we've got $100,000. Let's say the elective share is 30%. So the spouse gets the 30%. So if he or she went into the nursing home, he would have to spend that $30,000 on the nursing home. The other 70,000, the 70%, would be put in a trust for the spouse, and that trust protects the $70,000 from the nursing home. Then we can use that because Medicare, Medicaid doesn't pay for teeth, doesn't pay for glasses, doesn't pay for hearing aid. So if the trust, you know, if the spouse needs those type of, you know, assets, then we can use that for them. We did this for, you know, for a gentleman, and and we managed to protect his assets. And, you know, he was in the nursing home. He couldn't hear. His glasses, I don't know, must have been about 20 or 30 years old. And, he, you know, and that was it. So we got him in. We got him new hearing aids. We got him new glasses. And we got him basic cable. And he loved the animal planet. All he wanted to do was the lions, tigers, and bears, and all that type of stuff. Now, I'm not saying his quality of life was fantastic, but compared to where he was, it was a heck of a lot better, okay? And that was because we were able to protect some of his assets. And I still see his son. And, um, you know, he used to always comes up and thanks me for, for what we did for his father, so. We talked about wills, now we're talking about the trust. There's, there's different types of trust. One is the testamentary trust. That's what we've just talked about. That was what the testamentary trust is, a trust within the will. So I'm leaving everything to my spouse, but I want to put the non-elective share into a trust. That's a testamentary trust because it's gone through the will. Most people think about revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts. And there's also what we call special needs trusts. So as we talked about, the testamentary trust is a trust contained in the last will and testament. It's effective upon death and it's subject to the pro probate process. Now, the other one is what we call a revocable living trust. That's what most people usually have. So what is a revocable living trust? So we're setting up a trust. The easiest way to think about it is like a company. 
And that company, so with a company, you have a CEO. So with the trust, we have the owner. We call them the grantor. So the grantor is the owner. With the company, you have managers. However, we don't call you managers in trust. We call you trustees. We just change the names just to confuse everybody. And then with the, the company, you know, we have beneficiary, we have, you know, shareholders. With the trust, we have beneficiaries. So the idea of this revocable living trust is that I'm the owner. I set up the rules and regulations of the trust, who I'm going to give everything to, when I'm going to give it to them. I'm also the manager of the trust while I'm still alive or still capable of being the trustee. And I'm also the beneficiary. I can put money in, take money out. The whole idea of this trust is basically what we call is a will substitute. The idea is to avoid probate. So because when I die, I don't own anything. The trust owns everything. So therefore, there's nothing to probate. Probate is the process that you have to go down, take the death certificate in the will or whatever, and go through all these legal proceedings in the orphans course. You have to open up accounts, inventory, account, you know, inventory reports, uh, final accounts, paying off creditors, etc. The average probate usually takes over a year. So the, the idea of this revocable trust is to avoid that and all the costs associated with this. Now, we still, because I'm the owner, I still retain control of all the trust issues. However, the problem is with this trust is with the nursing home because once I'm the owner, I'm the manager, and I'm the beneficiary, if I can put my hands into that trust and get that money, so can the nursing home. So the revocable living trust does not protect your assets from the nursing home. So that's why we use what we call a neurovocable trust. And this is what we use in our, what we call our pre-crisis planning, okay? So what happens is we're very similar to the revocable trust so once again, I would be the grantor. I'm the owner of the trust. I set up the rules and regulations. However, the difference is I cannot be the trustee. I am not allowed to be the trustee. And also, technically, I'm not the beneficiary of the trust. So once I put stuff in there, especially what we're doing for a lot of people, is that we put the house in there. You can still live in the house. You can sell the house later on. But if that trust goes up, you know, um, lasts for five years before you go into a nursing home, then that piece of property or whatever you've put into that trust is then protected from the nursing home. Okay? But like everything in life, there's advantages and disadvantages. So basically, once you put that into the trust, you sort of lose control. There is ways. We've got little uh, exit strategies that, you know, we can still retain control of it because if your trustee is not doing what you want them to do then you can remove the trustee okay so one of our what we call our pre-crisis Medicaid planning is to use a neurovocable trust because once you put that property or assets inside the trust you get through the five-year period that is then protected from the nursing home so sometimes we also do what we call a special needs trust. Special needs trust is to benefit a child or grandchild who has special disabilities, okay? Like a lot of times, you know, if, you're, if your child is autistic or, or whatever, then, you know, if they're on government benefits, they can't have assets more than $2,000. Now, so well-meaning grandparents leave the, the, the special needs child, say, 50000 bucks. So if they get the 50000 bucks. They put it into their checking account. They're more than $2,000. They get kicked off Medicare and Medicaid. And then they have to spend that down and go through the system. So what we do is we set up this special needs trust or a supplemental needs trust, and we put that into the money, the $50,000 into that trust, okay? So they will not lose their benefits, as long as you're not using that money for what the government pays. So if they need to go on vacation, need one of those Medicare scooters or whatever, then they, can, then they can utilize that and they don't lose their benefits, okay?